Well, hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we've got an exciting speaker, Peter Schwartz, uh, with the Federal Railroad Administration. We'll be talking about the uh, uh, Midwest Rail Plan and what it means and what the next steps are. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping and some other things. But so Chris Ott is our deputy director. And um, he will uh, be monitoring the chat and the Q and A. And I see that we've already got a lot of people who have put chats in. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, and then Peter Schwartz will be giving the presentation. We're really excited about that. Uh, first, um, I want to uh, thank our sponsor, HDR. Uh, they're an engineering firm. Uh, uh, with national impact. We're very excited that they've decided to support our efforts um, and that they've supported this, this uh, webinar. Um, so again, thanks to our sponsor, HDR. I want to uh, go a little bit into why we do this. So we're an educational nonprofit. We strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of what high-speed rail is why we need to do it and what steps leaders can take to make that happen. And then we provide uh, people like you, motivated citizens, uh, local leaders, uh, the tools they need in order to educate uh, their leaders in their state capitals and in Washington, DC. Uh, this is an advertisement for Taiwanese high-speed rail. Um, uh, back when they first uh, launched it. And on the, the left-hand side there is uh, the grandparents spending the weekend alone uh, because there's no way for the family to easily get there for the weekend. Um, and on the left right-hand side is uh, the family has come to visit. So because of high-speed rail, now the grandparents don't have to spend the weekend alone. So high-speed rail and its connecting services, and we talk about high-speed rail as a package of services, makes it possible for people to see each other more frequently in person. And in person is when the real strong personal binds happen, when the innovation happens, um, and it's really critical to keeping us connected as a single country um, working together. So we believe in an integrated approach where high-speed lines work together with regional lines, uh, shared use lines on freight track. And there are many examples across the country of shared use working very well uh, with freight and passengers sharing the same tracks and inner city buses working together in a coordinated network to connect entire economies. So we think a lot bigger than the typical city pair this is about big towns, small towns, entire regions being connected together um, in one form or another. So if, um, if you like this webinar, if you like the concept of us having a big program, and we've got the first step towards a big program really going on right now, uh, please uh, take a minute after the webinar to go to highspeedrail.us. That's our website, highspeedrail.us and hit the donate button um, and we can continue to have good programming like this and the other efforts that we do to communicate. Um, so you really, in, in order to understand this, you do need a coordinated plan. Um, we believe that we need it on several different levels, uh, state, probably even urban area, state, geographic, you know, multi-state area and then national. California is the first to do the integrated statewide plan. It's very exciting. Um, and the, this uh, uh, effort by the FRA to do a, a big picture vision of what high-speed rail should look like in the Midwest is uh, uh, a huge step. So we want to uh, welcome Peter Schwartz today uh, to describe what that process is and what the results are. 
And at the end, Chris Ott will manage to answering questions. Uh, we prefer that you put the questions in the questions and then answers. Um, and we'll uh, have some time for questions and answers at the end. So thank you all again for being here. Peter, thank you for joining us um, and feel free to take it away. Get myself off mute here. Thanks so much, Rich, for, for having me into the high-speed rail lines generally. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to, to speak with you today. Uh, you know, Rich mentioned, uh, you know, that this is kind of a first step by FRA and that kind of systematic planning that, that uh, he sees and I think we all see is really important. But I want to correct him somewhat that while this was an FRA-led effort, it really was a collaborative undertaking between us and folks in the region uh, which I'll get into in, to, in more detail uh, a little later in the presentation. Uh, and I want to say that, you know, among the most active and uh, really important contributors to this effort was the High Speed Rail Alliance. Actually, when we started it, it was still the uh, Midwest High Speed Rail Association and uh, now the High Speed Rail Alliance. And, and Rick's contribution to this effort was really invaluable and, and want to make sure uh, to acknowledge then that everyone here is aware of that. Uh, today, you know, I'm going to be talking to you about the Midwest uh, Regional Rail Plan Study specifically, but also touch on these types of regional rail planning studies more generally and what kind of role they play in the development of intercity passenger rail. And probably start off by saying that uh, in FRA's parlance, and, and perhaps we should be a little bit more precise in how we put these things, but these regional rail plan studies are really intercity passenger rail uh, regional plans. Uh, they focus on intercity passenger rail service while still taking into account uh, commuter rail and rail freight service, but they really are focused on uh, looking at kind of a long-term view of intercity passenger rail development in a given region. So, you know, I'll touch first on, generally speaking, what these plans are and kind of where they came from and what they're intended to uh, achieve. Their real origin came from out of the requirement in the Passenger Rail Investment Improvement Act, uh, which was passed. I guess it was signed into law in early 2009, well, late 2008, it was 2008, so getting on 12 years now. Uh, which called for FRA to develop a national rail plan. As I think a lot of you know, the uh, PREA established a bunch of new programs, really unprecedented programs for federal investment and railroad capital improvements uh, with a big focus on passenger rail service. And this national rail planning requirement kind of went hand in hand with these new funding programs. Essentially, Congress looking at us to develop a real plan for systematically making use of what ended up being a fairly significant amount of funding that was appropriate under these new programs for, for railroad investments. But obviously doing a national rail plan is a pretty big undertaking and to do it all in one bite and to do it in a vacuum was seen as not just being infeasible, but very unwise. So. The approach that FRA adopted was to look to bite off kind of chunks of things, both splitting things up by subject matter. So in this instance, you know, looking at intercity passenger rail service specifically, but also looking at things uh, split up geographically throughout the country in terms of, of regions made up of multiple states. The idea being particularly on the passenger rail front that services generally function and should be developed as interconnected networks of multiple services and corridors. And you really need to look at it as a whole within these regions if you want to try to make sure that one, you're able to realize the benefits and the efficiencies that come with having an interconnected system. And two, that you avoid the possibility of developing things in a way where you've got inconsistencies or conflicts between individual services or individual uh, corridors. Uh, you don't wanna do something where you find that investment you make on one corridor uh, uh, kind of forecloses on opportunities on another corridor that may be a very great priority. So in keeping with that, 
FRA has now completed three of these regional rail planning studies, really intercity passenger rail region, uh, rail planning studies. Um, the first of which was for the Southwest region, really focusing on California, Nevada, and Arizona. Uh, and uh, that was completed. I think the report came out quite a while ago. Now, I think uh, 2008, somewhere around there. Uh, and then we followed that up with two studies that occurred concurrently uh, with one another. One for the Southeast, uh, shown in those purple states on this map here. And then the one that I'll be focusing on more today, I was the, the project manager for, for FRA, uh, the Midwest Regional Rail Plan Study, covering the states shown in blue on this map. And you'll see also that there's some lightly shaded states there. The darker shaded states really represent those that were at the core of the study, but we also, in all of these studies, took into account the potential for services in kind of adjoining states, what we call complementary jurisdictions, particularly those which have major markets, major metropolitan areas that are right adjacent to some of these state boundaries. Um, so we, again, we've completed three of these at this point. Uh, one of the questions we often get asked is how do we how did we decide on these three regions? And uh, I can't speak for the Southwest study, but for the, the round of studies that ended up focusing on the Midwest and the Southeast, we issued a I think we called it a solicitation for expressions of interest. Uh, really rolls off the tongue easily, but essentially solicitation for for folks to say hey. We're in this region, we're interested in having a regional rail plan study done here. Here's why it makes sense. Here's why it should be a priority. And we ended up selecting the proposals that uh, were submitted by folks in the Midwest and the Southeast. In the Midwest, the proposal was submitted by the um, Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, which is a interstate rail compact that includes membership of most, but not all of the states that participated in the study. But uh, MIPRC, as it's called, played a really uh, essential role in both putting together that initial uh, proposal and participating in the study going forward, actually, when we're in need of it. So next, uh, I'll turn to kind of situating where these regional rail plan studies uh, lie in the overall process of taking of getting to the point where you're actually making investments in improving existing services or implementing new services. You know, the, that last point is there in green project implementation, which really gets down to doing the final design and construction of railroad capital improvement projects. But it all really starts with what, you know, is called generally, and this is not just about railroad stuff, but kind of generally in the transportation field, transportation systems planning, where you're looking at kind of broadly challenges or opportunities that exist either specific to transportation or they can be broader economic or, or other types of, of challenges or, opportunity, or opportunities. And you work to identify uh, projects that appear to be good candidates for addressing those, those challenges or, or realizing those opportunities. So in the uh, in FRA's world, there are really two primary uh, types of planning work that we've done to date or that we've been involved in to date that fits into this bucket of transportation systems planning, that being the regional rail plans that obviously we're all here to, to, to talk about and to hear about. And the second being state rail plans, which really are, are state-centric plans done by state departments of transportation that look at the full breadth of rail needs and opportunities and potential projects within that state. Recognize, of course, that there's some limitations to those state rail plans in as much as a lot of the problems and, and uh, opportunities that can be addressed by railroad projects uh, are best addressed by projects that span state borders. So, you know, finding there's certainly some things that can be done within the confines of the state, but um, there's a lot that can be done that really uh, extends beyond the state boundaries. And that's one of the reasons why we have these regional rail planning studies. The idea is that as things are identified in systems planning, I'll focus on regional rail plan studies, you know, 
right now because that's, that's what we're here for. In regional rail planning studies, you might be identifying corridors for development or, or improvement. And those corridors essentially become projects and each one becomes a project in and of themselves. And there may be other types of projects that, that we'll discuss later that can arise out of these regional studies. And the idea is that once you have those projects identified, you kind of generally have uh, stated what kind of problem they're supposed to address or what opportunity they're supposed to seize upon and you know, what they're intended to actually do, what their, their purpose is. Those projects then can then advance into project development where you really start fleshing out what it's going to take to implement them, and what that project's going to look like in more detail. So, you know, in short, really, this type of systems planning document, of which these regional rail planning studies are, are an example, are the foundation for all other you know, future real you know, shovels in the ground type of improvement. And for those of you who got any kind of experience or exposure to other types of transportation planning work, uh, these are these state rail plan, or sorry, these uh, regional rail plan studies and, and state rail plans are as well are somewhat analogous to the kind of systems planning that you see captured in metropolitan transportation plans that are done by metropolitan planning organizations or statewide transportation plans that are prepared by state DOTs. But generally speaking, and certainly by federal statute, those plans as they stand today, focus really solely on uh, highway transportation and, and transit uh, really under the, the aegis of our colleagues at the Federal Transit Administration and Federal Highway Administration. So, I mean, this just kind of shows how these kind of studies uh, relate to each other. So for the Midwest Regional Rail Plan, you know, we, we had a situation where first off, we had many states in the region that had state rail plans in place with services and corridors identified. And we brought those in and folded those into uh, the Midwest Regional Rail Planning Study. Uh, likewise, to the extent that we identify new corridors or, or services as a result of this study, uh, that were not in those state rail plans, there's an opportunity to integrate those into future updates of those state rail plans. Similarly, in this region, and, and somewhat uniquely, or at least to the greatest extent, I think, of any place in the country, we have so many states that have been so active in passenger rail development, and they've been doing work to implement corridor, new corridors and improvements to existing services, for years now, even before FRA really stepped up its game following PREA. So we folded in those corridor implementation plans that existed already into our study. And similarly, where this our study identifies other corridors, other services, or further improvements to existing services, the hope is that this, the states in the region will seize on those and develop corridor specific implementation plans, that kind of project development work for those corridors. So I want to touch quickly on, you know, what the goals and the purpose of this study was specifically. And a lot of this applies to these regional rail planning studies more generally. So it, the re, it really was a long-term study, it's looking at a 40 year planning horizon and looking to come up with a 40 year framework for the inner city passenger rail network in the Midwest, focusing on, on a few key areas. And some of these, we were able to come to more uh, concrete and specific conclusions. For our, others of them, it was, uh, sub, it was more conclusions about next steps or options that the states in the region and other entities in the re region may pursue in the future. So, you know, first and foremost is, you know, uh, uh, prioritization or at least a, a schema of corridors and potential other investments that would be made to implement this long range vision for passenger rail in the region. In the end, the primary uh, output of the study in that area was, you know, a map essentially showing a proposed network with showing the, uh, the markets, geographic markets on each of the corridors that really have to be served for the corridor to be successful and some 
general conclusions on the levels of service, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail a little later, but the general levels of service that seem appropriate for those corridors, taking into account not just each corridor in isolation, but also how those corridors will interact with each other and have the ability to actually produce far more demand by allowing for trips that connect from one corridor to another. Uh, the second thing we were focused on was governance structure. I mean, that's a huge challenge and, and huge effort when it comes to passenger rail development. Uh, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You have corridors that span multiple states. You have other entities like interstate rail compacts, like MIPIRC, which I mentioned earlier, that come into play. You have operators like Amtrak and potentially others. And in that area, the Midwest study didn't come to any firm conclusions, but rather laid out essentially what the options were, identify where some of the challenges were with the idea being that with things uh, kind of established in that way, it would be the jumping off point for the states in the region, the region as a whole to figure out what solutions are most appropriate for the region because FRA is not going to dictate and doesn't want to dictate what approaches states will take, but we did feel like it would be helpful within this context to at least lay out what the options were. And kind of similarly on that third point of funding strategy, um, at the time of the study, of course, we didn't know that something like the uh, IIJA, the new infrastructure bill, might be coming down the pike. And, uh, you know, certainly FRA can't make any promises about funding. Sadly, we are not like our, our colleagues at FTA and FHWA that have formula funding available. But we did look at strategies for funding. So not just potential, the potential to pursue federal funding to implement some of these corridors, but also things that can be done within the region to, to help support the development of these corridors. So, you know, that kind of lays out the goal in terms of the purpose, you know, it really was to advance the planning for the future network in the, the Midwest. It is a long range uh, process, that very long 40 year planning horizon. We were looking to do really conceptual level planning for high performance passenger rail at this regional level, not getting into a huge amount of details at, you know, in terms of engineering and very detailed cost estimates, but more kind of order of magnitude estimates that are appropriate for making, coming to the kind of high level conclusions that we're seeking to get to as part of this study. As I mentioned before, you know, this was undertaken as part of that objective for FRA to develop a regional, uh, national rail plan rather, and, you know, to really support as well, as we looked at in that other slide, uh, both drawing from and feeding into other existing statewide and regional transportation planning processes like the state rail plans and like the broader long range transportation plans that uh, states produce uh, on a regular basis. And, you know, really, perhaps first and foremost, that last bullet or the idea here is to facilitate the future planning of individual corridors and streamline their implementation so that we have that sound foundation from which to build and can really work expeditiously from there to get some of this stuff done. Because none of us want to see these things just be you know, studies that are completed and they sit on a shelf, you know, collecting the proverbial dust and, and nothing really comes of them. So, you know, we rolled out, I did jump it ahead a little bit, but kind of an update on where things are. We did formally roll out the uh, the final report for the study on October uh, 13th of last year in Chicago, releasing the report jointly by FRA and MIPR, the regional uh, rail compact in the region. We had pretty good turnout, particularly under the circumstance of being in the middle of a pandemic. We had uh, local press affiliates, uh, Fox and, and ABC TV affiliates, Chicago Tribune came, uh, I think Bob Johnson is, is here with us today. He was there as well uh, in Chicago with us from Trains Magazine. Overall, we had about 40 attendees with speakers that included our now administrator at the time, deputy administrator, but he was just confirmed two days ago, I believe, uh, Amit Bose, uh, also the chairman of MIPRC and the executive director of MIPRC and, and MIPRC's uh, financial office, uh, officer and, and commissioner from Indiana. So, you know, I talked a bit about the purpose and goals of the, of the study, but we also 
refine that somewhat into some more kind of detailed insights on what we were trying to do. And in particular, trying to set, make it clear that the conclusions we were seeking to, to reach were really significant in many respects, but at the same time in ways they were somewhat modest. We weren't getting into a huge amount of detail necessarily in that we're looking to define corridors based on those essential markets that a corridor really would need to serve in order to uh, re realize its full potential while not necessarily dictating you know, a specific route or the specific alignment or specific intermediate markets that may be served, recognizing that that's something that really needs to be supported by a much more detailed level of analysis than, than one could do here. We were looking at defining the level of service very broadly by service, what we termed service tiers, of which there are three. Uh, one being at the top end, um, being true kind of greenfield high-speed rail, uh, operating on de designated tracks at very high frequencies and high speeds. At the low end of things, what we term emerging service, uh, which is fairly similar to what one might think of as some of the more robust state-supported services that operate today, things like the Hiawatha in the Midwest or Chicago, St. Louis, uh, the Wolverines going to, to uh, Chicago, Detroit, Pontiac. And then in the middle, what we term regional service, which would still operate over existing railroad infrastructure, but at higher speeds, um, you know, generally 110 miles per hour or thereabouts, and with higher frequencies than that regional or that emerging service tier, but, but not quite at the same you know, potentially hourly or more service frequency that you'd see at that what we term core express, that true high speed rail service tier. We also focus really on ruling out the unpromising options, but not necessarily settling on a very specific preferred option, um, whether that relates to service tier or even some of the routings of some of the corridors, which we'll see when we look at the map. And you know, lastly, we really placed a very strong emphasis on the value of the existing service that is out there today and the other services that have been proposed you know, prior to us initiating this study that may have a lot of value, you know, independent of how they might contribute to the you know, performance of an integrated regional network, but they still are valuable and they can't be left out of the equation. Now, I'll, I'll touch on some of this briefly before, but I became very clear early on in the study that we talk about what this study isn't to avoid some misconceptions that some folks had kind of from the outset. The study did not identify specific routes or alignments. It does not identify specific station locations. Even for the markets that are shown on the map, the exact location of the station is neither really considered in the analysis nor specified in, in the final report. We don't really look at uh, or come to any conclusions regarding capacity or operational feasibility. There are some broad assumptions made around what kind of capital investments would be needed in order to support these services, but nothing at a detailed level. We're not doing simulation modeling or, or anything of that nature that gets down to that kind of uh, investment specific level of detail. And lastly, you know, this really is a study. This is not something that sets out any kind of commitment to implement specific projects or necessarily the whole vision. There's a lot of other things that that'll be contingent upon, not the least of which it is funding, whether or not from federal or from other sources, but it does lay out a game plan. Whether or not or how that game plan ends up getting followed is going to rest on a whole bunch of other factors as well. You know, I mentioned this from the outset, I mean, really a core part of this, maybe the most important part of this effort was the, the participation of folks from outside of FRA. Uh, we convened as part of this a stakeholder planning group, which I think had around 40 or 50 uh, organizations or individuals represented. That was made up of 12 or actually 13 lead stakeholders, which made up which were represented by the state departments of transportation, 12 states that made up the region, plus MIPRC, uh, plus the interstate compact that many of those states are a member of. We also included other types of stakeholders, the post railroads, Amtrak, commuter railroads, metropolitan planning organizations, local government, 
advocacy groups like the High Speed Rail Alliance, as I mentioned, which were really a very important part of this. And as I mentioned before, we kind of kept in the loop, but they weren't you know, truly active participants in the study, these complementary jurisdictions. And in this case, uh, we were looking at Kentucky, New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ontario, all of which have fairly significant metropolitan areas that are often right on the border, if, if not you know, somewhat away from the borders of the states that were included among the lead stakeholders. Coming out of that lead stakeholder group, we came up with some uh, kind of guiding principles or some planning goals for the overall study. I won't go through all of these, but you know, the idea was we kind of know what the end objective is uh, in terms of what we're trying to come out of the study with, but what kind of things are we going to consider to drive the conclusions that we reach? What are kind of the factors that we want to take into account? And these are not FRAs you know, uh, making. These are things that really came out of the discussion among the stakeholders. And it was very refreshing that we found that there was a, a pretty high degree of consensus around these. And it helped the process enormously as we kind of went through the analysis and looked at different options that we all were kind of working off of the same um, set of goals and the conclusions that we ended up adopting almost just flowed directly from these goals without a huge amount of wrangling or internal debate beyond that that was really helpful and, and kind of was able to make us feel confident that we were looking at the right options and, and uh, taking into consideration everything that was relevant. So with that, we'll turn to really the main <laughs> conclusion of this, which is the map. Everyone always likes to look at the map. And this is where we landed on in terms of the proposed network for uh, the Midwest. Uh, what you see here in terms of the bold lines are the corridors that were identified as being really essential to an interconnected network of services within the Midwest. The ones where, based on our analysis, we found that there was a lot of connectivity between these corridors, which opened up a huge amount of opportunities to serve markets that any one of these corridors individually would not be able to serve. Uh, travel between Madison and Kalamazoo or from Fort Wayne to St. Louis, um, from you know, Columbus to Louisville even, where you'd be making use of multiple corridors, but um, still having a very high level of integration. The dashed lines represent either existing services or services that, are being, that have been proposed that clearly have merit, but whose success and kind of value lies largely independent of the network overall. Not to say that there wouldn't be some degree of interaction and benefit of having all these things integrated, but our own analysis found that, you know, they, they largely could kind of stand on their own. And, but we wanted to make sure that we reflected all of those in the map and made it very clear that uh, those are part of the future as well. Their implementation may be somewhat in, independent of a kind of more sequenced, prioritized uh, implementation of those bold colored lines, but they're in, important nonetheless. The other thing you'll see here is that there are some bold, actually two lines there that are bold but dashed uh, going from Fort Wayne to Columbus and Indianapolis to Columbus. And those reflect the fact, in keeping a, with our, our goal of ruling out on promising options, but not necessarily focusing on a single option, we found that there were, it was a little bit of a coin flip how you get to Columbus. That was, it, it was important to have Columbus as part of the network, but whether or not that's via a connection to Fort Wayne or Indianapolis, or perhaps both, that's something that really you need to do a more detailed level of analysis than what we were able to do here in order to make that conclusion. Similarly, the colors of the bold lines correspond to those service tiers that I mentioned earlier and really trying to focus on the tiers that seem to hold promise for each of these corridors, but not necessarily that they're the only way of, of doing things. So the purple colored lines is Core Express. And what we found really is that for Chicago to the Twin Cities, where, where you're talking about a pretty long distance, and I should say Chicago to the Twin Cities via Milwaukee and Madison, which both of which were found to really be essential for the success of this corridor, uh, 
you're talking about pretty long distances and you're talking about a very large travel market between the Twin Cities and Chicago. And if you really want that corridor to do everything that it can and, and fulfill its, its true potential, you're going to need to go fast in order to get a competitive trip time between uh, the Twin Cities and Chicago. The teal color there, though, shows corridors or portions of corridors where our analysis found, you know what, you could do, do a pretty good job building those out as core express, but you could also fulfill a, a lot of potential by building those out at that regional service tier. And again, where we felt like we couldn't support you know, a, a definitive single conclusion, we said, hey, listen, these both have promise, keep them in the mix, and a firm decision on those can be made as part of you know, corridor specific planning that would follow on from this. The other thing that that takes into account as well is that there may be portions, say, of Chicago to Detroit that you may want to build out as core express in portions of it where you could make use of the existing infrastructure. You could have a corridor that's a, a mix of things, which is not an uncommon thing uh, throughout the world, particularly when it comes to access to, to major metropolitan areas where building new infrastructure is pretty diff difficult. So, you know, we kept that option open as well. Uh, the red lines really do represent those portions of the network where it did seem like that regional service tier was the most appropriate avenue for future development. And uh, the yellow line, the one that we have there shows that the Chicago Quad Cities Des Moines Omaha corridor really seems best suited to that emerging service tier, at least within that 40 year planning horizon that we adopted as part of this study. Uh, again, you know, there's a lot of, these are just three service tiers. You can roughly kind of square them away in your head as being you know, kind of new high speed rail for Core Express, uh, regional being somewhat similar to say uh, the regional service that you have in uh, the Northeast corridor and emerging or for that matter on, on Chicago, St. Louis and Chicago, Detroit, Pontiac, and then, you know, emerging being very similar to some of the higher uh, frequency um, state supported services that exist today. So one of the questions we, we were asked, uh, particularly later on in this and with the rollout, is how does this relate to Amtrak's Connects Us proposal, which came out just a few months prior to the rollout of the Midwest Regional Rail Plan study. And, you know, I think fundamentally the Connexus proposal is a similar type of passenger rail, intercity passenger rail systems planning exercise, looking at, hey, where might we run service? Where might things make sense? And I mean, first off, looking at the maps, you'll see that there's almost complete consistency in the Midwest region between the conclusions that we reached and the conclusions Amtrak reached as part of their uh, visioning exercise. And that's, that's no surprise for a couple of reasons. One, Amtrak participated in our study and I think uh, you know, they drew on some of our analysis and uh, you know, helped drive some of that analysis and some of the conclusions that we reached. So that is a clear source of consistency there. But also you know, the fact is, yeah, I forgot who said this, but there's a quote that floats around. Someone here probably knows the source of it. Of, you know, why do air, airplanes all look alike? You know, well, because you, know, you can't cheat physics. There are just some, some basic fundamental realities in place that, that drive certain conclusions. And the same can be said of transportation planning in many cases, in many respects as you know, the development and design of something like an airplane where you've got travel markets that are there, they, you know the volumes, you know how they're gonna grow, you know the other options that are available in terms of highway and air transportation, and you know where the opportunities are when it comes to developing passenger rail service. There are some, some differences though. You know, we looked at a planning horizon out to 2055, Amtrak was looking at a, uh, a uh, more short-term planning horizon up to 2035. About, you know, we were both fundamentally rail, passenger rail transportation system planning efforts, but we had somewhat different emphases and objectives. Likewise, we were looking at the potential for new high-speed rail lines while Amtrak was very focused on operations over existing lines. 
And, you know, we were, we very intentionally had a very collaborative effort among regional stakeholders, including Amtrak. And Amtrak, for understandable reasons, and, and certainly I think you can draw a, a bit of a line between not just our regional rail plan studies, but also the work Amtrak has done with the kind of excitement for funding that came out in the infrastructure bill. But Amtrak did undertake their effort largely in, in isolation with some consultation with others, but you know, they, were, they were looking for a vision that reflects what they think the potential is based on what their interests are. So it's where we differed a little bit from them as well. So touch briefly on, on next steps before we um, head in just to, to talk briefly about the infrastructure bill and then go into Q&A. Um, really the study from FRA's perspective in, in terms of our role is complete. And it's really a handoff to the stakeholders in the region, to the state DOTs, to MIPR, to others who are involved in this, to take the lead on implementing the conclusions that we reached as part of this plan. And you know, it's between where we are now with this kind of systems planning study and actually getting shovels in the ground, there's gonna to need to be more work on, on project development. That could be in the form of corridor specific studies, Clearly there's, there's the need for that, focusing on individual parts of the proposed network. There's a need for tackling the issue of access into Chicago, which is huge and, and has been getting a lot of attention recently and that cuts across multiple corridors. And also the, the equally huge issue of how you actually serve Chicago with the station because the service levels that uh, the Midwest plan's conclusions reflect are far beyond what the existing station would be able to support. And you're going to need to, if you want a chance of growing things to that point, you're going to need to be looking at other options, whether an expansion of the existing station or additional stations within Chicago. We don't come to any conclusions about that, but clearly it's a, it's a challenge that's going to need to be addressed. Likewise, it's going to be up to the region to start setting priorities for how they start developing some of these projects, which ones to tick off first with the understanding that, you know, the goal is that no one gets left behind here, that there's going to need to be a, a prioritization. Something's going to need to go before others for logical reasons, if for nothing else. You don't want outer parts of the network getting built out first with no way to connect to the inner parts of the network. You want to work your way to a certain extent out from uh, the trunks to the branches. And again, that's gonna be something that uh, is gonna be in the folks in the region's hands. And you know, lastly, you gotta address the governance issues. How do these future kind of project specific planning, project development work, how does that get done? Does it continue to be just by the state DOTs? Do they start looking at MIPR playing a more role or other types of governance, governance structure, role of the private sector, all sorts of things. We identified the issues, but it's going to be up to folks in the region to identify the solutions they want to adopt. And, you know, same goes for actually implementing the projects and, and running the operations on an ongoing basis. Uh, how is that going to be governed and how did the states within the region uh, you know, interact and really work together to make things, sure that these things are a success? You know, obviously, just after, um, just after this was rolled out, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was, was passed, which has a couple of provisions that clearly intersect with what we did here with the regional rail planning studies. The first is establishing an interstate rail compact grant program for FRA to provide funding directly to interstate rail compacts like MIPRC, and MIPRC is really only one of two active ones that exist today for uh, their administration to do additional systems planning, operations coordination, it's pretty wide open, uh, but there's money available for that. And that is really huge in terms of building the capacity to get this stuff done, because it's not gonna be just FRA that does it. And to kind of fill that gap between, you know, state DOTs, which whose remit really is often focused firmly within their state boundaries, and you know, the federal level where we're not gonna be doing this stuff directly. There needs to be some, some kind of entity like these interstate rail compacts that can bridge that gap and, and serve as that means of, of interstate cooperation. 
The second big thing is, is the bill creates the new corridor identification and development program, which calls for uh, DO, USDOT to solicit and select corridors, uh, and actually not just short corridors, but long distance routes are included there as well uh, for future development, for new services or improvement to existing services. And um, clearly the kind of systems planning efforts like these regional rail plans will help to kind of feed into that. In fact, the statute gives preference to selecting quarters that were identified in regional or interregional, like long distance type uh, intercity passenger rail systems planning studies. So a pretty clear link there. So that's uh, what I got um, left maybe a little bit too little time for Q&A, but we got about 13 minutes here. And just again, here's my contact information if anyone wants to reach out. And thank you again for, for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very, very helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we go over if, if people want to stay over and ask more questions. Um, I, would you be able to do that or should we just cut it off right at, at one? Uh, no, I can, I'm free to go over. Let me just double check, see what, what I got <laughs> on the horizon. So, yeah, no, I'd be able to go over. Okay. Uh, we'll see how this goes. But thank you very much. That was incredibly helpful. Um, I want to get a little bit more clarity on how much you actually looked at whether rights of way were available um, and the actual physical feasibility of doing these corridors. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great point, Rick. And the, the fact is that it was at a, a fairly high level. I mean, certainly in terms of um, particularly the potential share use uh, corridor or service tiers, the regional and emerging service tiers, we looked at the existing rail lines that kind of lay along those corridors more generally and their kind of high level characteristics to develop those kind of super high level order of magnitude cost estimates of what might be necessary to support passenger rail service at, at different uh, levels of service. But it wasn't at a, a really precise level of detail. And that part of the reason for that is the idea here was to be able to look at a very broad, you know, or, or very expansive level or, or number of options and kind of churn those options through fairly quickly, Rick, as, as you experience. And in order to do that, we needed to keep the analysis at a fairly high level. But what went hand in hand with that is that we couldn't make that level of analysis can't support very, very specific conclusions, whether or not that a corridor should lie on a specific route and connect specific intermediate markets, or that a very, very specific level of service would be appropriate for that corridor. I mean, we think that we got to enough detail really to, to achieve the objective of saying, hey, listen, how do we develop things in an integrated way, in a way that realizes those opportunities for efficiencies and for increased benefit by taking more systematic approach of things and avoiding places where th things may come into conflict with one another. But, you know, it's still going to take, there's still a lot of work to be done to go from where things stand right now, the conclusions we've reached as part of this plan, to where you can have confidence that you can put shovels in the ground and make investments that you know are going to have the results, at least operationally, if not in terms of demand that you're anticipating. So uh, what entity do you think drives the getting this to actually getting the design done and ready to go and let's get some money to build it? Yeah, and I mean, that's where the kind of corridor identification development program seems to be the means of filling that gap. And in terms of the entities, it has things very wide open. It can be states or groups of states or interstate compacts, or regional transportation agencies, or uh, federally recognized Indian tribes. I mean, it's really all over the place, actually. And it's gonna be up for the folks who back these proposals to decide who's the best one to carry them forward. Certainly the model in the past has been very much focused on state DOTs, uh, but in the future, clearly there's the ability for other folks to step in. I mean, I think one of the challenges that a lot of folks, including myself, who are 
advocates for this kind of thing face are situations where within the state, you may have a lot of communities along a corridor that are very supportive of the development of it, but where at the overall state level, there may not be that support. And I think what's clear right now is that there's a, an ability there, um, obviously money being the big kind of challenge, but there's the ability there for even local governments to band together to support the development of these corridors. It doesn't necessarily need to happen at a state level. Uh, and it could also be, you know, private sector entities working in concert with the public entity. It could be Amtrak working, you know, in the lead with kind of secondary support from uh, local or state government or other groups. But it, it is pretty wide open. I think it's going to vary depending on the corridor and depending on the part of the country. And, you know, there's this one specific, specific one that I keep focusing on is, you know, from Toliston, which is just outside of Chicago, to basically Lima, Ohio. There's this railroad there that doesn't have much freight on it and is straight. Yep, um, it was once a fantastic railroad. I think someone fantastic. said standard of the world or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I am highly confident that there are steam locomotives going at 125 miles an hour on it um, up until the 50s. Uh, not legally or not officially, but if somebody wanted to get home for dinner. Um, uh, but it could be a funnel. So you've got kind of this challenge of getting around the lake um, and then things start to spread out into Michigan and down to Indianapolis maybe, depending upon how do you get to Indianapolis. But there's this one piece that could be the funnel for Detroit and Cleveland and, and Toledo and Columbus, et cetera. Yep. But, how do we start thinking about how we get an entity to, to build, you know, to focus on that one piece? Yeah, and I, I guess that is really, as I said, it's going to be up to, it's going to be kind of more grassroots. I mean, we're here at FRA certainly to help folks out. You know, the Interstate Rail Compact Grant Program, this new thing, offers one kind of new avenue for us to actually provide some financial support for that. Uh, but that's clearly going to be the key. And, and, you know, Rick, you mentioned another thing. I think one thing that can get lost at times at the, with these kind of high level studies is that they end up having the potential to be really kind of pie in the sky and kind of ivory tower exercises and stuff like that. But the idea here is that you need to do some of that higher level work. But when you get into project development, that's really where I'm going to say the rubber hits the road, but really where, where the wheel hit, hits the rail, I guess, would be more appropriate here. But where you gotta be looking for the low hanging fruit. We got to make sure that this stuff gets done cost effectively. And when there are opportunities to use existing rights of way rail lines that are either abandoned or being really used at a marginal level right now that could be upgraded both to support intercity passenger rail service, potentially improve freight service or commuter rail service as well. Those are things to be looking at. We shouldn't be starting off necessarily saying, hey, you know, let's act like it's a complete blank slate and we're just going to design whatever it is like it's the 1860s and we're building railroads out into the wilderness. We got to be looking at what things are like right now and see where the opportunities are. And, you know, things like, as, as you know, the, the PR main line and, you know, going across what's now the, the Comet right of way along the lakeshore there to get into Chicago. There are a lot of opportunities there that could end up really driving some of the more detailed conclusions about how you, you, know, you implement individual corridors. Yeah, the, the, the interesting one in, that, in the other direction is Milwaukee, right? Where um, I've started coming to the conclusion that maybe it could be spread out over multiple routes instead of focusing on one, so you could get a lot more frequency. So in talking about frequency, I'm horrible but remembering numbers off the top of my head. So if I looked them up just in case, but, you know, one thing I want to emphasize is in your proposals, even in the emerging, the lowest uh, level, it's very high, it's really high frequency. Um, and I, could you talk a little about um, I, the specific numbers? I think it's like 26 a day for Core Express. That's right. Yeah. So we looked at, and I don't, I actually thought we might have the on this slide that's kind of an appendix to the presentation I just gave. Um, 
we looked at kind of target frequencies for these different service tiers. And, you know, even at the lower level, it really is looking at something that is around, you know, every other hour to even upwards of that type of service. So, you know, I mentioned as examples of that, you know, the high WAP is the Wolverines, the Lincoln service. And, you know, I think really, the, the high WAPAs are closer to what that kind of emerging level, that lowest tier is in terms of frequency, even while the Lincoln service, the Wolverine service is, um, you know, maybe closer to what we're looking at in terms of speed. I mean, that even gets up into the kind of regional corridor level with the 110 mile per hour operation with ITCS and uh, ETMS. So, you know, the, the uh, PTC systems that are allowing for those higher speeds. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the frequency is kind of the name of the game. I mean, I, I think I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir for a lot of folks here that speed is great, but if you don't have trains going when people want to travel and they're going to need to deviate from when they'd like to travel, they might take something that's slower just because it's actually going to get them there closer to when they want to get there and allow them to leave when they want to leave. So there was a real uh, premium placed on the value of, of frequency, which is, you know, borne out by actual experience, um, you know, both in the U.S. and abroad, that uh, you can get a lot more benefit putting an equivalent amount of money into increasing frequencies than you might be able to, in some cases, in uh, decreasing trip times. Um, and then, uh, Chris, are there... Oh, I wanted to emphasize one thing, just my view of this for those, because I saw lots of, well, what about this piece? What about this piece, right? Why don't you have this listed? Why is this one dotted? I see this as kind of the foundation upon which you can add a lot of other stuff. But if you've got these core routes working in a really robust way, it then makes it possible to do the other stuff in a much more robust way. Is that a good way of thinking about it? No, I think that's that's absolutely right. And that, you know, you need that foundation. And there, once you have that established, there's a lot more that becomes feasible. And, you know, that's reflected in, in you know, the kind of math that's the cornerstone conclusion of the study is that, yeah, you got all those bold lines there, things that clearly need to be developed in kind of an integrated way and in a systematic way. But that could open up the door to have uh, a whole lot more uh, possibilities in terms of extending service to other areas and, and whatnot. Excellent. So um, for those who want to limit this to just an hour, thank you for being here. Um, and remember highspeedrail.us and hit that donate button. Uh, we want to grow our staff so that we can reach a lot more people a lot more quickly. Uh, but Chris, are there um, any, um, any questions that I think there's a lot. Are there any? There are many. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, this is actually, I think, our, our, our biggest audience uh, yet. So thank you, Peter. Thank you to HDR. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I have a feeling that we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm not going to take them as they came in chronologically. I'll try to sort of group them together thematically. Um, and uh, I'll, I also just wanted to mention for those who asked, several people asked, um, yes, we do. Uh, we will make the recording of this event. Uh, available within a, a few days. It'll be on our website under the events page. And um, for those who wanted Peter's contact information, uh, that was in the slides. And Peter, if you know if you feel like uh, sharing that again, please do. Uh, but uh, first question um, from Scott Rogers. Uh, how does the designation of a corridor in this plan, such as Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, Twin Cities, uh, inform next steps in developing a corridor like that, including funding from the infrastructure bill and incremental steps like the uh, the second train to the Twin Cities or additional frequencies? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think you know, the, the actual infrastructure bill itself is pretty explicit about that in as much as under this new corridor identification development program, which again, seems like it's intended by Congress to be the mechanism for developing new services and improving existing ones going forward. It gives priority to, you know, all of the things being equal, gives priority to corridors that were identified in these types of regional rail planning studies, or as I mentioned, 
potential future interregional rail planning studies that are looking at connections between these regions because you know we don't want to have things completely in isolation and end up with a whole bunch of islands of passenger rail service scattered around the country with even though there may be some very significant markets that uh, you know one end lies in one region and one end lies in another. I mean you certainly see that in the Midwest, particularly in, in interactions between the Midwest and the Northeast and Southeast and, and, and South Central as well, for that matter. Um, so there really is intended to be that kind of link um, and that you know, priority would be given to things that are identified through these, these plans. Now, that said, we've only done three of these plans that only cover a portion of the country. So, you know, hand in hand with wanting to make sure that you know, investments are kind of guided through a, a rational process of planning and stuff like that. You also want to make sure that there's some equity geographically around things. So you know, I think that these regional rail planes are going to play an important role going forward, but um, you know, they need to get the country covered with them for them to really play that very consistent role there. Uh, and, you know, it's going to take some time before we get there and we're not going to be you know, sitting on our hands until that time. We, there's money appropriated, there's excitement around this and there's opportunities out there and, and we got to get rolling now. Okay, thank you. And um, will, the, will the FRA support uh, state plans for service improvements or new, new services that aren't a part of the, the framework that you've just been discussing? Yeah, I definitely anticipate that'll be the case. I mean, I, I will say that, you know, if you look at it very broadly, you know, services identified in the regional rail planning study, in the Midwest, at least, we tried, and if we didn't, it's with apologies to capture on that map, essentially everything that's out there right now or has been out there recently. I think uh, the real question is going to be, or, or the, the higher likelihood that things are gonna be done that haven't been identified through these studies are in parts of the country where we just haven't done one of these studies. And those parts of the country are not gonna be left out just by virtue of the fact that they had, haven't been subject to one of these regional studies yet. They're definitely gonna be in the mix. And, and some of those have extremely promising uh, corridors and, and proposals that folks have put a huge amount of effort into already that, that merit you know, moving forward with. Okay. And with the, the long 40 year time frame for this, um, can you say more about what the FRA will be doing in the, in the near term uh, this year and next year, say? Yeah, I mean, the big thing when it comes to the objective of this study, that is you know, new services or big increases and big improvements to existing services, the name of the game looks like it's gonna be this corridor identification development program. That, that is gonna be the means for getting proposals for new or improved service ready for implementation. So that's going to be a huge part of it in and of itself. There are a few things, though, across the country, either projects that are in process or uh, proposals for services that are well on their way to being ready for implementation that I'm not quite sure if they're going to kind of sidestep that new program and maybe go straight into funding, but may go into this new program and kind of be done with it fairly quickly, or at least that portion is done with it very quickly where they're moving on into implementation on pretty short order. So that's really where our focus is right now in terms of the very significant amount of funding provided in the infrastructure bill to support this stuff. And you know, at the same time that we wanna be setting things up in the longer term, we have to be getting stuff done in the nearer term now. And there are a lot of opportunities out there for it. Thanks, Peter. And um, uh, next question is, um, why uh, is the FRA using a different time frame than, uh, than tw the 2050 time frame that is being used for so many other climate change goals? Yeah, you know, I think part of it is that this started quite a while ago, honestly. Um, the study actually kicked off, I'm trying to think, 2015, something like that. It was a bit of a long slog here for a number of reasons. So I think if you look, we actually adopted a, a planning horizon. You look at not the date, but the years out, that was fairly consistent 
um, with a lot of what's being looked at in terms of, of planning around climate change and whatnot. Um, but you know, it was a, with a similar kind of intent that we need to look very strategically. We need to look in, in the long range and what makes sense in the long range, not just what makes sense now, knowing that decisions that are made in the short term are gonna have long-term ramifications. And if you only are looking at what the ramifications are out, say 10 or 15 years from now, you might reach very different conclusions than if you look further out. And, and that's why we did have that longer range um, uh, planning horizon and you know the discrepancy somewhat with that come 2050 uh, horizon that's kind of gotten a lot of headlines around a lot of climate change planning and analysis. Yeah, I think the five years is probably kind of in the rounding error, honestly, or it's, uh, it's, it's pretty close. Okay, thanks. And uh, we've talked uh, uh, some about time, so let's talk about money now. Um, Henry Mason asks, uh, the report says the full network capital costs would be uh, from 116 billion to 162 billion. Can you say more about uh, how that was calculated? Yeah, so a couple parts of it. So in terms of how it was calculated, it was really at this very kind of high level uh, capital cost estimation methodology looking at, uh, you know, for core express issues of cost per mile and whatnot for the potential for the service series regional and emerging that would use existing rail lines uh, or perhaps reactivated rail lines, uh, looking at cost per mile relative to kind of what we think can be done with what's out there today versus what might happen, you know, going forward. Uh, it really was not hugely more sophisticated than that. There is a little bit more of a level of detail below it, but it was very, very high level analysis. And again, it allowed us to say, run an uh, analysis of a given scenario very quickly and kind of turn it over quickly and look at a whole bunch of different scenarios. Whereas if we went a huge amount deeper than that, looking at such a broad variety of scenarios probably would have been infeasible. In terms of the ranges though too, that's one of the questions we've gotten. I'm not sure if that's one of the things that this person was asking about, but it reflects, the range of costs reflect a couple of things. One, uncertainty. So the analytical methods we use kind of have low, middle, high estimates for various uh, unit costs and things like that. And the range reflects kind of the low to high spread there. But also, as you saw, the conclusions we reached both in terms of the configuration, the network and the service tiers has some flexibility in it as well. So the range also reflects the difference between say, some routes, some corridors that seem like they could be regional or core express being built out as core express for the high end of the range or as regional for the low end of the range. Okay. And uh, Mark Perot asks, uh, what effort uh, has the FRA made to avoid uh, planning eating up uh, most or all of the funding uh, so that instead we can focus on implementation? Uh, he says, you know, we've been planning for years, but implementation is always in the out years and the energy and funding can wane by the time we get there. Yeah, that's absolutely a, a concern. I will say that, you know, one of the things that worked out somewhat nicely, whether or not you want to you know, attribute any causality around it, I think doing so would be pretty generous to FRA. But yeah, the fact is that since 2010 and until the IIJA, there had not been any really huge appropriations for passenger rail development specifically uh, at the federal level. Um, what we did have, though, is the emergence of, of grant programs like the Chrissy Grant Program and the Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair, now Federal State Partnership for Intercity Passenger Rail Service, that emerged that at least showed consistent funding for it. But really, in, in no year from 2010 until this year, um, enough money to do anything like what was done on Chicago St. Louis or Chicago Detroit under, under the Recovery Act and the 2010 appropriations. So we're hoping that the work that we've done in the interim is actually going to, and the whole aim of it was to kind of set that foundation to make use of the money to build stuff when it becomes available. Now we've got it and you know, it's gonna be an incumbent on all of us who work on this, not just at the federal level, but you know, state and regional level too, to make use of that money and, and get stuff done. Because I think the, 
person's question was right on. You know, there is the risk of kind of analysis paralysis and, and whatnot and not actually getting things done. But uh, at the same time, you want to make sure that when you're doing things and when you're spending billions of dollars on projects, that you can have confidence or you can have as much confidence as you can that they're going to achieve what they were set out to achieve and they're going to be implemented in a way that you know is consistent with all the assumptions at the time the, the go-ahead decision was made and not you know go vastly over budget or take far longer than was anticipated. Okay. We have a, a question from uh, Greeny Van Buren about Amtrak, and, and I think the answer to this is yes, but I wanted to give you a chance to elaborate. The question is, is, uh, is Amtrak a potential contractor to implement uh, the, you know, this regional rail plans uh, recommendations? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they absolutely are a potential contractor. I mean, certainly when it comes to, you know, under the law right now, state supported services under 750 miles that are operated by Amtrak, um, you know, with state support kind of Amtrak is the contractor out there. There are, for better or for worse, a lot of barriers to entry for other entities. And they're not insurmountable, but there are barriers to other contractors actually operating service uh, over um, existing railroad infrastructure. Um, if they aren't Amtrak, for those who are kind of familiar with all of the various statutory rights that Amtrak has invested in it. You know, Amtrak may also end up being an entity that actually builds stuff or becomes the project sponsor, uh, working perhaps with a state, but may actually be in the lead. I think the fact is there's not going to be kind of a one size fits all um, solution to these things or a one size fits all role for Amtrak in these things. I think even Amtrak recognizes that, that in some cases, um, they may, a state may say, hey, listen, Amtrak, we want you to just go run with this. We're going to apply for the funding, or maybe even Amtrak applies for the funding, go get it done. In other cases, it may be a state or an interstate compact or a group of local governments who says, hey, listen, this is going to be our project, but we're going to have Amtrak play certain roles in this, you know, as the future operator, as, uh, you know, participate in figuring out what capital projects would need to be built, whatnot, you know, I think there could be varying roles for Amtrak one way or the other. And in some cases, there, in some corridors, there may be no role for Amtrak. Maybe, you know, completely other people involved. And we see with Brightline in Florida and the Texas Central proposal, you know, down in Texas and uh, California High Speed Rail with the selection of DB as their, uh, got the term they use, interim service operator or initial service operator that you know, Amtrak isn't necessarily the only game in town. Um, I think there's one more and then I've got a, a fun follow-up question and I think we'll wrap it up. Okay, um, I also wanted to mention, just speaking of, of Amtrak, um, Peter, you know, you're getting a lot of uh, props in the, in the chat for uh, including Fort Wayne um, uh, because there's uh, some unhappiness that Amtrak has not. <laughs> so I wanted to mention that. Um, but here's, here's one more uh, question um, from Ken Sislak. Uh, the, con the congressionally designated high-speed rail corridor from Cincinnati to Cleveland uh, didn't make it to the emerging stage and is illustrated by a dotted line signifying um, uh, you know, that it's a, a small uh, market or future corridor. Can you say more about, about why? Yeah, there are a couple of interesting points uh, from Ken's question. First off is what this interaction is between the federally designated high-speed rail corridors, which, you know, that was something that first came out of ICE-T, the Surface Transportation Bill back in 91, I believe, uh, before my time working on, on this. And, you know, that kind of continued to a certain extent for about you know, 10 years or so subsequent to that. And what the relation is between those corridor designations and these regional rail plans. And I have to say that, you know, I think essentially these types of regional rail planning efforts are kind of taking over the mantle of the role that those earlier corridor designations were intended to, to serve and are doing so in a way that's a little bit more, you know, has a little bit more substance to it. I mean, some of the earlier corridor designations were prescribed by statute. They were just, you know, Congress said this is going to be a corridor. For some of the other ones where DOT had discretion in making the designations, while there was uh, a fair degree of kind of consultation and, and 
collaboration with folks throughout the country and making those. And there was, you know, solicitation process and everything like that. Um, it wasn't to the same kind of uh, extent that we've been doing with these regional rail plan sites where we really are working hand in hand with state DOTs and others in the region to figure out what the, the path ahead may be. Uh, in terms of the corridor that was cited specifically, uh, I mean, the fact was, and the reason it's reflected that way in, in, the, in the final report is that the, our analysis found there's a lot of merit to that corridor, certainly, but its success doesn't necessarily rest, based on our analysis at least, on being part of this kind of integrated network necessarily. Um, not to say that it doesn't have merit by itself, but again, the focus on this study was less to kind of capture, although we, we did, but less to focus primarily on everything in a region that may have merit, but really focus on the things where you need to be looking at it in an integrated way, in a region-wide way, where you don't want to be having certain things being developed uh, kind of out of sync with other parts of the network. And what we found with that corridor is that it didn't seem, it, it seemed to have a lot of merit, but it really was kind of independent of the rest of the network. Excellent, thank you. You know, I, I frequently point out, the reason I'm in this uh, is because I was upset that they were pulling the wires down in Cleveland Union Terminal back in very historic times. And I said, I'm gonna get electrified trains back into Cleveland Union Terminal. So, and I remember, being excited about the vote for high-speed rail in Ohio that would have been Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati. Um, and that was close with a little bit more work that could have happened. Um, so Ken, I agree with you. We should have high-speed rail on the 3C corridor. Uh, one last question before we go. Um, you didn't show the, the uh, Southeast map. Uh, but if you showed the two together, they connected Nashville. Uh, Chicago to Atlanta is about the same distance as Beijing to Shanghai. They do that 72 trains a day, fastest in four and a half hours. Well, how do we get the conversation started about Chicago to Atlanta? Yeah, and I think uh, in this, I'm going to give Rick you here a plug here that you within the, the Midwest plan were along with a few others, but you especially an advocate for the need to like, not just be looking at these things at a regional level, that there are inter-regional connections that may be incredibly important, whether or not it's Chicago, Atlanta, or Chicago, New York even, which again, you know, is not out of sync with some of the distances of some of the longer high-speed rail routes in China right now. And, you know, we have been talking internally at FRA about, how we need to supplement these regional plans with interregional plans that take the output of these regional studies and say, hey, listen, given these conclusions we've reached at a regional scale, what opportunities are there for connections between the regions? And you may end up finding, and this is something we discussed at, at Rick's prompting uh, over the course of the study, is the fact that there may be a need when you start looking at things at that interregional level to revisit some of the conclusions you reached when your focus was just at that regional level. So for instance, you know, Chicago, Nashville, Atlanta, the question of whether or not that might be new high-speed rail versus, you know, that regional service tier. If you find that the market, you know, all the way from Chicago to Atlanta is, is, is promising enough, you may say, hey, listen, this isn't a coin flip anymore. There are enough opportunities that really would require very high speed service to say, we ought to do this core express. We're gonna just end up settling on that. So that's definitely gonna to need to be part, part of the equation. And, and, and you know, Rick, you were right during the course of the study to point out that need and to make it sure that it's on our radar screen and that we take it into consideration. Because again, we don't wanna be making decisions in the near term that's you know, gonna paint us into a corner in, a long term, in the long term and you know, keep us from pursuing some of those opportunities for connections between the regions. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very much for, for joining us today. I, I really appreciate uh, the time you spent with us and the, the willingness to go over. Um, the, you know, to all the members that have asked how we make this happen, 
We've got to focus on the governors. Um, even with Brightline in Florida, the governor of Florida played a key role and they would not have been able to get access into Orlando Airport if there wasn't a high-speed rail plan that, the, that Florida put together in the 90s. Um, so it's a focus on the governors. Um, we're working to do that by educating local leaders. So again, please uh, join us if you haven't already by hitting the donate button on our website. And thank you everybody for coming. And Peter, again, thank you for coming. This was excellent. Uh, nice for having me. Yep. Talk to you soon.